So you're making IMOs. What the heck's an IMO? <laughs> well, IMOs like like really excite me. Um, IMOs, it's basically indigenous microorganisms. This is so cool because with the rice, we're able to culture microorganisms off our farm and off our areas, you know, regional areas. And what that does, the micro, the indigenous microorganisms, what they found are really hardy. We're able to now, we can buy EM, we could buy different microorganisms, we could buy compost, we could buy compost extracts, we could buy biology, but the problem is that biology was grown somewhere that is not at our farm. It was grown under an environment that is controlled. And those microbes are not as strong as our indigenous microbes. So we can, our, the indigenous microbes are, you know, the gang of microbes that have been around for thousands and thousands of years and have naturalized to our areas. So we can, we can cultivate fungi or bacteria. Fungi is really important for the garden. You know, usually we have more bacteria in the garden. We can cultivate, it's really cool because we can take, and I, I, I did a little experiment and I made up a batch and it came out pretty nice. So I'm gonna show you guys, but we can, basically we can go out to the woods with this cedar box. This is, this black area is where the, compost actually got in here. Um, there's a little bit of black mold starting in here, but most of this is all white mold. And this came out of the worm box over at the other farm on Kimsey Road. So we're able to cultivate the microbes out of that worm box. Or, you know, we can basically, this is like a traveling container for collecting microbes all over. Is that rice in there? This is rice, yeah. So basically, super simple. It's one part rice, one and a half parts water. Um, we boil that and we keep it kind of dry. Um, we put it in our cedar box. We decide on a location. Um, you know, if we're trying to get a deep, rich fungal blend, fungi off the farm or out of the woods, we'll go to some of the biggest, oldest trees with the deepest leaf litter, the leaf mold, and we can cultivate that. So it's, it's super simple. We make the rice, we make it dry, we put it in the box. We put basically a paper towel over it. We have to put a screen on it. This, this works okay. I'm gonna build a, a whole box that screens it. The time before, the week before, I made some of this at, the ha at my house. And um, even with this screen, um, raccoon or something got into it and ate all the rice. So I was kind of bummed. <laughs> and that happens, that's pretty regular. Um, so we can go to, like I said, the oldest forest, or we can go, if we're trying to collect bacteria, we can go out to the fields where it's a really fertile field that's maybe just a little bit in the shade. And you're gonna dig this box in just a little bit into the ground. You're gonna cover it with the, you're gonna put the rice in. You don't pack the rice. You're just gonna place it in there. Cause really the, oh, the whole key is the space around the rice. If it's cooked too much and it's packed in there, then it's anaerobic. If we keep, if we keep space in there, then the microbes, the mycelium can grow into that space and kind of connect all that and it's aerobic. There's air and space in there. So this takes, basically, I was pushing this because I started this on Monday 
and the class is, you know, today is Saturday, so that's what, five or six days. And the worm box is in a greenhouse, so it's already warm. And it was yesterday, this was ideal. Um, this was all white, perfect white fungi on here. And what happens is over time, the spores will grow out, fall down, and then this will turn dark mold. Um, you want to kind of avoid the dark mold. If it's, if it's white spores that are grown up and fallen down, it's not as bad. A lot of times you'll get, inside this, you'll get black mold. You'll get, you can get yellow mold. You can get red mold, pinkish mold. All that's kind of okay, but you really want to stick with the white mold. The Korean natural agriculture has a long history of fermentation, and it goes back to Korea and Japan and China, the whole area. And white mold, they found, is generally like the good stuff. That's what they're looking for on their products that they eat. So that has kind of um, spilled over into you know, making the uh, Korean natural, the, the IMOs, like we stick, with the, we stick with the white mold. So basically, this is IMO1. And what I've done is cultured this. And so now we have the culture. And this, this is kind of the other unfortunate thing that happened. I don't know if you guys can see that. It may look kind of disgusting, but, you know, we're farmers here. It's good stuff. Soldier flies got into that, which it's not going to hurt anything, but it looks bad. Um, so we're able to, to collect this culture and grow it out. And we can keep, just like the preps, we can keep stepping up the potency of this. So this is IMO1. IMO2, we mix with sugar, and it it holds this into a stable shelf life form. So we can, we can start to go around our farms and collecting beneficial life forms and stabilizing them. And later on, there's several different methods, but we can bump, bump it up all the way up to IMO5 if we want to. From IMO2, we can spray that out directly. And all it takes, again, is just a little pinch of this stuff when it's, when it's finished to be able to spray this out. Um, there's billions of life forms in this. And I don't know if you guys want to, but the other way you can, um, I'm gonna pass this around. If you guys wanna smell it, you can. It smells really sweet. Um, this is the other way that you can check to see if you have a good batch. If it smells off, if it smells like mold, then just chuck it out. It's kind of cool. If you do get mold in, in your box, the mold spores will get into the wood, but it's really easy. Um, vinegar, and in Korea they use a lot of rice wine vinegar for everything, but vinegar is an amazing cleaning agent. You know, it's non-toxic, but you can, you can, if you get uh, black molds and different things in this. You can douse the box with it, put it out in the sun, and it basically eliminates all the molds. The couple batches before I had black mold and I put the uh, rice wine vinegar with it and it just totally eliminated that. So feel it, it's super spongy. It smells super sweet. So I'm just gonna do a quick demo because this really needs to happen anyways. I'm like, was holding this off. I really should have done this yesterday. Stabilized it, but it's still good. It's still good. So basically what you do to take this to IMO2 is you get your trusty little scale out. And this would be better if this was a newer scale where I could zero it out, but I can't. So we'll just have to do the math. Um, you guys are good at math, so that's no problem. Basically, it's right now we're at seven pounds. So I'm going to put, and I'm going to try to keep the, uh, there's a lot of the soldier flies that got in here. 
But I'm going to try to just kind of pick them out. They're mostly in the bottom. They're not going to hurt anything. Um, and the soldier flies cooperate in the worm bin to transform the material in the worm bin. Um, they're beneficial, but you know you really don't want them in your IMO. So I'm just going through this real fast, picking out the soldier flies. Anything super dark, super black. Most of this is compost that got in there. The soldier flies basically, I put compost on top of this and they just like kept wiggling and worked their way in and broke into the, uh, the paper towels. Tenacious little boogers here. Korean natural agriculture has now been uh, practiced all over the world and it really started taking off after um, the Beijing Olympics because the Chinese government, the military, has a thing where anywhere they go they have to produce their own food. And Beijing is obviously a, you know, population density is really high. So, and I don't, I'm not advocating, obviously not advocating factory farming, but they brought in a, a pig farm and it made such a stench and there was a huge uproar. And they heard about Korean natural farming and Korean natural farming has been used to raise pigs that are happy, healthy, and with no smell, and they don't have to clean the cages. Or, well, it's not even cages. They basically build these pig houses that are pole barns, and, thank you. And the bottom three foot of the, beneath the piggery, the very bottom is charcoal, Three foot on top of that is either is some kind of waste material. So it's rice, husks, or people have done wood chips, or in America, you know, wheat is more prevalent than rice. So uh, wheat hulls, things like that. And they culture out their IMO and they have found that the whole floor becomes alive. And when the pigs manure on the ground, the floor actually eats the manure. They don't have to clean it out. They don't have to change the bedding. They're raising incredibly healthy animals. And the same thing with uh, chickens. They're doing the same thing with chickens. They're, they're giving them more space, which is a good thing. Um, in like a commercial raised piggery. And I'm not necessarily advocating that, but I think it points to the uh, potential power of the IMO. Very powerful stuff. So to take this culture, you put the towels down and put the worm compost on top of it? Yeah, I did the worm compost, but you could do different things. You know, the worm compost is obviously very alive and I just wanted to make sure I had a culture to show you guys. And it's just like, it was the perfect environment. It was warm, it was moist. The cultures that, you know, out in the woods necessarily this time of year, it could be a lot drier. It's a little bit harder to get a culture off of. But yeah, it could be leaf litter on top. So you basically, yeah, put your paper towel. You can either, you can do a rubber band you can even staple it or you can just fold it over and then put the uh, wire mesh on top and then load it down with leaves. And what happens, or worm castings or you know whatever you're trying to culture,
but what happens is the paper towel pores are a lot larger than the microbes. And so the microbes work their way in, fall through it, and then you're able to collect that. So, okay, so we basically just have a pound, just a little bit more than a pound. What is this? This is a pound and a half. So to make IMO2, super simple. You use sugar. You use uh, the most raw, dark sugar you can get. Uh, a brown sugar is really good. It's got a lot of nutrients in it. But what this does is it sucks out the moisture. It almost, um, within a few hours, almost instantly, but not quite. Whoop, did I get too much? Oh, that's about right. Oh, and then I'm gonna add this other one. It, after a few hours, it draws the moisture out of the uh, rice and puts the microbes in basically a stable state. They're similar to like being in a desert. The spores are still active, but they're basically sleeping. It's drawn all the moisture out of it. So it makes this stable shelf form that you could basically keep this, once I mix this, uh, you keep it clean. This, you can keep this for years. It's sleeping, but it has active potential once you mix it with water. So it's super simple. You just come in here and mix this up. Oh, but I wanted to show you this also, I almost forgot. I did a little side experiment. You know, they use a lot of bamboo. Um, I, I, filled, I filled bamboo up with rice. And it was kind of a cool side-by-side -side experiment because I think this worked a lot better. This is a little bit slower. This has more surface area for the microbes to get into. A lot of times they split bamboo like this and then put the paper towel over it so you have more surface area. I had this. I just wanted to try it. It worked. It's, it's still pretty nice. Um, it's, it's not quite as far along, but it's fine. It's super sweet. So I'm going to add that. I'm just going to, I'm going to double check the weight. I don't think that weighs a whole lot, but you basically just want to go one to one with the, the IMO, collected IMO rice with sugar. So so I'll add just like another half pound of sugar. Or so, pretty close. So I'm gonna quickly, this doesn't take a whole lot of time. I'm just gonna mix this. You're kind of like making almost like a bread dough. You're kind of just massaging it together you want to break up all the clumps. And why we're doing all this is this is how we can this is how we can breed, this is how we can build our own biology on our farm. This makes all our practices more efficient. If we have living biology that we're spraying out, then all of our permaculture practices are going to work better. Um, we're going to enliven the soil you know, we're going to get higher yields. They found substantially, I mean, 200% increase in yields by applying simple IMOs to their land. So basically, this can be sprayed out on the land. So to spray it out, you mix it? And uh, you mix it with water, and you would spray it out. But... There's, there's several other steps where you're going to use this culture to, you're going to grow this culture out. So, so this little bit, we can grow out, you know, maybe 50 to 100 pounds of culture from this. Then we take it through another step, and we, we would add the IMO3, we would add um, 
some kind of waste product, wheat hulls or rice husks, something like that. Grow this culture out on that again. And then we would keep bumping that up all the way to, so you could spray this out, long story short, but you can increase the potency of this. You can add native soils with it, grow that out. You put it into a stable shelf life form. And you're basically, you're just making compost tea out of it, spraying it out. So, okay, so we're getting pretty close. So is there somewhere with all the, uh, the steps or the levels you would recommend, like a resource? Because yeah, there's um, a Korean natural farming um, hand, free handbook online. Yeah, there's a lot of YouTube videos, a lot of people doing it. I just basically just wanted to just put this idea out there. Uh, we don't have enough time today to necessarily go through all the steps, but I just want you guys to uh, have this in your mind as one of your tools in your toolkit that I think biodynamics, Korean natural farming, and compost tea, I think those are like simple ways of getting a lot of material out of the land and it not costing a whole lot and it's easy to apply. You know, back in the day, why people got out of farming was because it's so damn laborious. If you wanted fertility on your farm, you basically had to, to keep your animals and spread a lot of manure by hand. Anybody who spread manure by hand knows how heavy that stuff is. And that was a lot of farming chores were about trying to get fertility on the land by spreading manure. So now we, we still want to spread the manure. The manure is still healthy. The manure is like what builds, you know, lasting fertility on the farm. But we have to be more efficient. And this is really about, you know, using good design. And if we're doing permaculture, it, it doesn't matter. It's taking the best from wherever we can get it. Okay, so next step is a little organic vinegar. And basically, what we want to do is just, I did a pretty good job, but we don't want to, we want to basically just clean this up. We don't want to um, attract any ants. So if we clean this up, you know, with vinegar, we'll keep the ants from getting in here. If you really have a big ant problem, you can put this in a tray of water where the ants can't get in there. Just a little bit more. I think we're getting close. Oh my God, the rice. I'm smelling the rice, the sugar the vinegar, it's like, I might have to make some sushi here. next step. Okay, if we had more time, I would clean that up a little bit better, but that's, for what we're doing, that's great. Um, this is not paper towel, obviously, this is um, wax paper. We're just gonna put wax paper over this. You can get a stiffer piece of wax paper that'll go on that. And then, I don't know if I have a big enough rubber band. Let's see if that'll work. Watch your eyes. Yeah. So, IMO2, done, easy. Didn't cost us anything. This has millions and millions of organisms that we could put to work for us, easy. This is, this is you wanna sit for two weeks. And then you can you could bump it up to the next level, IMO3, or you can mix this up with compost tea and spray it out just a little bit. The cool thing is you can get a whole collection of these and add just a little bit of each one to your compost tea or to your next bump out. And then so you're just increasing the the uh, effect of microbes on your farm. I guess you're, you're, I guess you took the white 
like fungi. So you, that, that's good. But I guess if you're you're in a warm den and you're grabbing some from a culture in a forest, how do you know you're uh, replicating positive versus negative uh, microbes? Traditionally, like I was saying, they stick with the white molds. Yeah, so as long as you've got like 75% of the white mold, that's considered, in this system, that's considered good. You know, we're going to be, once we bump this up, we're going to be able to look at it under the microscope. So we'll know a little bit more, but you know, you have that big time lag. So you have to have, in the field, you can't really, you know, look at each piece of mold, decide what you're going to get. So that's kind of like a good standard, is to stick with the white mold up to like 75% of it. So that's the box, you know, with rice in it, super easy, that's before it cultured. This next slide is uh, just a quick little clip of spraying out compost tea in the greenhouse down here. So I'm not really going to go into compost tea too much. Um, I'm just kind of touching on it. But I think, like I said, those biodynamics, Korean natural farming, and compost tea are three very effective ways of getting out fertility and biology on our land. Rocco's done an awesome job. The greenhouse is full of diversity. This is peppers, some buckwheat in flower here. There's sweet potatoes on the edge. Just want to give you a sense. And then look at all the uh, diversity and cover crops in here. Amazing. So that's compost tea. Compost tea costs us virtually nothing. It's very easy to apply and it's quick. So, you know, those are all like good things that we could do. I also want to talk a little bit about our permaculture system here. Um, we're collecting water off the farm. You know, we're up, on this point where we are in this building is pretty much the highest point on the land. Um, we've positioned a pond right out here that's basically, you know, also on the highest point on the land. So we're able to collect water through our swales that are down the hill here. And this clip is one of the days that the water went after we had rain. And water is run through the system. So basically, it works its way down. We capture it. It works its way down to the bottom pond. There's a windmill that pumps it up. It pumps it up up here. And then we could gravity feed back down. The system here is still very young. Um, you know, it's basically a year old. So we're utilizing it. We're utilizing it to water the greenhouse, but there's a lot of other potential things that we could do here. So we basically, we're just getting started with the potential of this system. Um, so the water's running down. This is after a nice rain. There's a little transition zone to where it runs down through some wetlands. Um, this area was grown up. I don't want to talk about this too much, but this area, there was already a little frog pond here. We put a liner in it. It now functions as a little sedimentation pond. And the water can work its way down through here. And eventually, it works down into the bottom pond. This is. You know, every, going back to biodynamics, the farm individuality, every farm is different. Um, every permaculture design is different. You know, this works great here, but this might not work so well on somebody else's land. Here, you know, this kind of strategy works together perfect with the windmill. I wouldn't say windmill will work on everybody's land. Here we have a lot of wind in the windy season that matches up with the rainy season and we're able to pump the water up and use it up here. So I really love the idea of collecting water and it's really cool 
to kind of watch the evolution of a pond. Pond really demonstrates itself pretty quickly through the evolution of biology. So you're basically, you're capturing water and nutrients off the land. The first season, you basically, you're capturing kind of silty water that works its way down. Not a lot of life happens, but come spring, you'll start to see water beetles and insects start to enter the pond. At that point, you wanna add a really good bucket of mud from an existing pond that has healthy biology in it. And you basically want to cultivate the microbes from that older existing pond into the new pond. So the new pond has to come alive and it takes some time. So when you put that bucket of water in there or the bucket of mud from another pond, microorganisms start to grow out in your new pond. And you'll see water beetles, and then first thing after that, you'll see lots of frogs go into the pond, lots of eggs, frog eggs, tadpoles. Tadpoles are really neat because basically lots of wildlife eat tadpoles. It's a way of growing out fish in your pond for free. It's another way of, you know, another strategy for raising fish for nothing. Um, and you'll see lots of birds eat frog eggs uh, and tadpoles. And so one of the first things you wanna do in spring after you see the tadpoles is you wanna add some kind of minnows. It's really small, I don't think you guys could even see it, but minnows are very important because they will eat the mosquitoes. And then minnows are kind of the next evolutionary building block, the biological next level of the biology in your pond. So it's like you're really starting simple with, I mean, it sounds kind of biblical, but you're starting with mud and you're working your way up through these really simple, small life forms and it's one building block at a time. So pond is really building biology and that's strategy is a timing. So there's the technique and the strategy and the strategy is what we're working with on the pond. So minnows go in, they control the mosquitoes and if you get minnows early spring, they will mate and have spawn really quickly. Uh, within about two months, if you put a small amount of minnows in, you'll have a hundredfold minnow population in a few months. So for, again, relatively nothing, you know, we're, we're just, that's I think is our job is to just kind of like work with managed timing as a farmer that we can take advantage of, maybe not take advantage, but cooperate with nature you know, and have the, uh, have the biology grow itself out. So the minnows spawn, and then that's a perfect time to start to introduce uh, kind of the next level fish in there that can eat the minnows. The minnows are, will control the mosquitoes, but they are also food for the next higher up life form. And that could be sunfish, bluegill, you know, catfish. Carp are really good to put a few carp in a pond. Carp can control some of the algae growth. Uh, you basically have several types of algae that grow in a pond. Algae is very cool because it's a nitrogen fixer. It's unsightly and we don't like the way it looks in our culture, but Algae is taking out nitrogen that is coming across the landscape, is entering the pond, and the algae is fixing it into a stable form so it doesn't leave the pond. So there's a fixation, you know, another layer, another cycle going on there with the algae. You basically have three kinds of algae. You know, you kind of have the scum algae, which floats up, and we see that, and we really don't like the way that looks. The carp, carp will eat some of that, but 
the um, phytoplankton algae is what kind of turns your ponds kind of green. And we don't like the way that looks either, but that's actually very beneficial. You're producing at that point billions of cells of phytoplankton. Fish eat phytoplankton, it's fixing more nutrients, and, and we have filament algae, which can kind of grow long and is mostly in the bottoms and stuff. And carp fish will eat a little bit of that. But so that's basically like it's this building block one step at a time with these, you know, lower life forms working their way up. And then, you know, at some point, if we want to, we can feed our fish, we can raise worms, we could raise soldier flies. There's a duckweed is grows incredibly fast. There's some down bottom. I don't think we'll make it down there today, but it basically doubles in size every two weeks. So it's it's super fast, super easy to grow. Winter kills. So we don't have to worry about that. So there's a little. Um, I just want to point out this nutrient cycle happening in the pond. So fish excrete, you know, ammonia, poop and pee, and ammonia is is, you know what ammonia is, you can smell ammonia. It's, it's really strong and it's, it's toxic, basically. But it's really cool. There's beneficial bacteria. And this, this goes with a natural pond or a pond that you built and with an aquaponic system. So it's the same kind of cycle of nutrients that happen. Beneficial bacteria, the bacteria that you added from the bucket of mud grows out into the bottom of the pond and it converts the ammonia to nitrite. Um, nitrite is also toxic to fish, and that gets converted through a different kind of beneficial bacteria to nitrates. And here's like the secret to the whole thing. We have nitrates, then we can use the nitrates to water basically irrigate anything. Our fields or our greenhouse down here, plants can take up nitrates and it's very good. So that, that whole process at that point is we're building again, we're building fertility for nothing on the land. We're building our nutrients from the land. We're working with nature and it's all kind of cycling and happening and it's easy. So, any questions about that? So are we building ponds, we don't have a pond, or we have a pond that we want to you know, maximize or utilize, are we doing that primarily to end up being able to have nitrates through that process to water the land with, or maybe to grow fish so that we eat, or you know, all you those know, I things? Think that that, I think that that's a, um, that's a really good question, because it's, it really goes with the needs of the landowner. It goes with hand in hand with um, kind of what the land can carry and what your needs are. A pond is the most kind of dense energy environment on our piece of land. You know, we can grow out fish a lot easier because their weight mass is supported by water than we can land animals. Fish can take on they can grow out and take on weight a lot quicker. So yeah, fish, um, a lot of people just, they wanna swim in ponds, makes it super nice to have some place to swim. When you get a lot of life in it, you get a lot of algae, you know, it's not necessarily the most kind of pleasant place to swim, but if you, you know, there's some strategies that we can do to clean the water and to work with that. So, you know, there's a whole, but you can use it to irrigate as long as you've got a sufficient amount of nitrate in it. Right? Exactly. And you, you can test that, but basically that process is a free process that's happening all the time if you've got good bacteria in your pond. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So raising fish, you know, but really just, just the complexity of having the wildlife in the system. 
and all that that kind of brings to your piece of land is really important. And that's like a part of the farm individuality, kind of wakening your farm up as this organism that's unified and growing and kind of working together is really important. Here's a little slide of releasing minnows. So in this pond, actually. So nothing to it, just order your fish, boom. You got your uh, mosquito control right here. You got the first step of building your own fertility, of building your own nutrients out of your system. Because when I look out, this pond is about a little bit less than halfway full right now. We've been using it. We haven't got a whole lot of recharge over the season. We've had substantial rainfall, but we haven't had a lot of runoff. So runoff is kind of a seasonal thing. In winter, you have more runoff. You can collect more rain. But I look out here at this pond, and it's how many raindrops is that that we've collected that's in the system that's sitting there? You know, it's just raindrops that would have left the farm. It's so cool. And we're, we're uh, kind of lucky we live in a place that we could collect the water. A lot of places, you know, it's illegal to collect the water off of your land, which doesn't make any sense. You know, they don't want to impact um, water downstream, but the more water we collect and can store on our land, and if we can do that over a larger area, the whole region will have more water. Anyway, so a few added layers. This pond doesn't have any of these layers, or no, not really any of these layers. We need to add these layers, you know, water plants. Shading ponds, very important. Cuts down on the algae, keeps the water cooler, healthier. You know, bamboo is really important around ponds. Bamboo can lock in dam walls, basically like rebar. It grows and, and uh, fortifies. And then it grows so nice and tall that it offers quick shade. So bamboo is super important, and then we could use it. We can make biochar out of it. You know, we can do 100 different projects around the farm with it. It's really important to have bamboo. One of the problems with bamboo is it likes to spread, but we can put, um, we can actually dig in barriers for that and kind of keep bamboo where we want it. We can also have animals graze bamboo. Goats eat bamboo. Uh, the leaves are really good. It's high in silica, super healthy. Trees around the ponds, mulberry trees. There's lots of worms that get on mulberry trees that fall into ponds. It feeds your fish, you know, and the insects happen. It's these, these are just kind of things that, you know, the trees and the bamboo and the water plants we can add, but some of the kind of neat little free natural interactions is there's insects that go into the pond. There's lots of birds. They're offering, you know, their bird droppings, which are, that gets into the pond and that gets in our land and kind of helps with that whole nutrient cycle. So it's just more free nutrients. And at some point we can build up uh, kind of like a sustainable yield or a sustainable harvest, you know, with a pond, we don't necessarily, or with most of our systems, we don't really want to take, we don't want to, you know, what's the old saying? Kill the dairy cow to get the steak or whatever. You know, with a pond, we can raise fish and eventually the pond is prolific enough that we can harvest some of that and really not affect the whole system. Quick sure. So down here in the south, it's kind of warm in the summertime. Yep. You know, I think a lot of these ponds you're saying use a liner, right? Keep the water in. Uh, the most of the ponds that I well, the most of the ponds that I build, I try to do a, a clay liner, okay. a natural liner. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so then, uh, minimum depth, size of a pond, surface area, so it doesn't get too hot. You know. Yeah. There's all 
there's a lot of critical factors with that. Yeah, if you're going just fish, if you were just going for only fish, you know, it's maybe six to nine feet you would want your pond. This pond out here is almost 20 foot deep because we wanted volume to collect water off the land. You know, so it's, I think there's, there's different ways of kind of like working out all that, what you want. Different purposes. Different purposes, different outcomes, but I think you can really design all that in. You could have different heights in your pond if you wanted that. All right, you know. Yeah, you could have shelves, you could have plant shelves. There's just lots you can do with it. So I already talked about this basically. We're growing vegetables off of captured nutrient runoff. So not only is the cycle happening, the biological cycle happening in the pond, but we're actually collecting runoff that the water is flowing down and is taking silts and particles and nitrogen and things. Especially here we have, you know, grass-fed animals and so we'll get runoff from that, and that all ends up in the pond. It's really important. It's kind of the ideal is to keep our nutrients in the system as long as we can, cycling in the system, and to keep the energy in the system as long as we can. So here, you know, just to go back to our example about this piece of land, we're capturing water it eventually works its way down to the bottom pond. The windmill is pumping it up to the top pond. And then we're irrigating, gravity-fed irrigation down bottom. So we're, you know, that's about four or five things that we're extending the energy in that system where it would normally just fall out. This is also very important. It's the uh, restructuring of water. Dr. Emoto, did all these famous scientific studies of putting different energies in water, you know, even emotions, and then studying the crystals, the ice crystals that happen. And we found that, you know, having beneficial emotions structuring water has a positive effect on it. So we can actually structure our water. Structured water is kind of cool. Like natural structured water happens in creeks, happens in streams when it, it has flow. There's a, a molecular connection that the water connects in sheets, kind of like ice, but it's still liquid. So we can do that with waterfalls in our ponds. We can, uh, flow forms, I don't know if you guys know what flow forms are, but it's basically kind of like a little waterfall that we can stir some of the biodynamic preparations in or compost tea, or we can aerate the water out here. But we can basically, again, we can potentize and kind of make the natural resources that we have more available and healthier. Aeration is great for the pond, obviously. And then there's biodynamic stirring machines that can restructure water, or we can do it by hand. Apparently, when creeks meander, the reason they meander is because they're going in a spiral. And, and they're doing it, and that's the same as the biodynamic. And I'm just realizing that's yeah. the potential. Yeah, that is amazing. It's mim yeah. Mimicking nature. I think that that's. That's like all the secrets are right here. That's why it was straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The meander is awesome. Slowing down the stream, but having the vortex that rotates in it. We get more length out of it. And, and there again, we have more energy is held in the system longer. There's more edge effect. Think about a, a straight creek or a creek coming through here and think about how many opportunities for trees, plants, you know, animals, all these extra interactions that can happen with the meander. I mean, it's, it's biomimicry. Everything that we do in permaculture, we're just trying to understand and, you know, apply to our land. So stacking animals, you know, in permaculture, one of the ideas is stacking as many functions in a given space as possible. So 
in our, with our animals, we can also, and I put a few examples in here. I didn't go overboard. But just to kind of like, uh, I want us to have the uh, ability and the freedom to just have kind of a lucid thought process when we're working with our animals. And not that we're going to apply everything that we think of, because some of it may not even make sense. But we need to really develop intuition and kind of like this creative side of ourselves. I think that is art on a piece of land. And I think that that's kind of like the future. You know, it's not pouring concrete and straightening out the creeks. and it's like the opposite of that. So when we stack animal systems, we can have less work. We can let the animals do a lot of work for us. The nutrients can transform faster. You know, there's many examples of pigs turning compost piles, working with that, chickens doing that. There's more productivity in the system when we can add different layers to it. There's more overall health. And we're really trying to seek less of a single kind of production stream and more diversity in everything we do. So here's a couple examples. I already said a couple of them. But chickens and worms, or chicken pens over worm boxes. We've done that at our house. Or worm box that we open up for an hour a day, and we let the chickens in chickens heating the greenhouse. This works awesome. You can have a greenhouse bench that underneath it, the chickens can roost at night. So if you have a certain amount of density, if you have enough chickens, they put off enough body heat to actually heat your greenhouse. And they're staying nice and toasty. Rabbits over worm bins. At our place, we did that for years and years. You can grow amazing, fertile, compost with rabbit droppings. And the rabbits poop right into the worm bin, and you're growing worms, and you're just, you know, ducks in ponds with fish. Ducks poop in the pond. In a lot of countries, they grow fish from pigs pooping in the pond, pig manure. Tilapia can basically you know, that puts more fertility in the system, more algae, more growth, and tilapia can eat basically anything. So uh, one really cool one is a floating solar light. So you could actually, you could have these little floating, you could even make floating wetlands or just like these little rafts, and you could have these little solar lights at night that go off, and it's just kind of floating out on your pond, and the bugs are like going nuts over and falling in, and the fish are eating the bugs. I talked about mulberries over ponds, pigs making swallows. You know, we were talking about that earlier, about your pigs doing earthworks for you. You put the fence line up, and the pigs are always pushing. That's kind of their natural tendency. Chickens are always sorting. They're sorting compost. So it's like we're working with the natural aspects of the of the animal, and that's really what we want to do. The pigs can make these crazy swallows. You know, they'll dig out a section, and next year you could plant squash in it. And there's so much fertility in that area that the squash just take over. And it's in one section you'll have, you can have a 500% increase in yields. It's it's substantial. A couple pig swallows, you could basically feed your family winter squash all year, or all winter anyways. Quail work great in greenhouses. We've had that in our greenhouse. Uh, they really don't disturb the plants, but we'll go after the insects. So here's just a few examples about you know how we can kind of incorporate, and there's many more, and there's lots of things that we just need to think. We just need to start using our brain and like having, getting out of this like straightforward, simple way of doing things, and not necessarily complicating it just for you know, making it complicated because we want to prove something, but because that's the natural systems work together and are complicated. So I just wanted to end with a Buckminster Fuller quote. 
and it's basically talking about revolution. You know, it's we we're teetering on revolution. And Buckminster Fuller, you know, he lived. I don't know the year he died. I think he was alive in the 80s. But you know, he did an incredible amount of design work. And his whole thing it was very similar to permaculture, except he was on the more technical side of it. He was all about the design revolution. And I love what he says in here. Design science produces so much performance per unit of resources invested as to take care of all needs. So I think that's the future, is let's have a design revolution. Appreciate you guys coming. <laughs>